It's February 8, 1990. Mark Mahalovic had just picked up the phone. His wife, Margaret, was on the other end. Saying that they had found Amy's, uh, they had found Amy. His 10-year-old daughter, missing for four months, was dead. She had been brutally murdered, her body dumped in a field. The despair was overwhelming, the anger, the hurt too deep to describe. The killer must be caught. Justice must be done. More than 30 years later, the key investigators are still working, still determined to catch the man responsible. In this episode, we'll look at evidence in the Amy Mahalovic case and profile the killer. Could he still be out there? Could there be more victims? I'm Nicole Versansky, and this is Dark Side of the Land. When Amy's body was found, she was wearing the same clothes as the day she was abducted, but some items were missing. Turquoise earrings in the shape of a horse head. Black boots with silver buttons along the side. They would have gone up to about Amy's ankle, no higher. A black leather binder to hold school papers with the words Buick, best in class. A white windbreaker. Detectives say people who commit these crimes will sometimes keep items as souvenirs to remind them of the crime or the victim, particularly jewelry. These items, earrings, boots, a binder, could still be with Amy's killer. Amy's body itself provided evidence. DNA, a type called mitochondrial DNA, was collected. Three hairs from someone other than Amy or her family. But unlike a blood sample, this type of DNA won't conclusively lead to just one person, at least yet. Think of it this way. You're looking for a person in a stadium. Nuclear DNA, like blood or body fluid, will take you to the exact seat. Mitochondrial DNA, like hair, will only get you to the right section. Here's Bay Village Detective Sergeant Jay Ellish. The majority of cases that people see being solved around the country, cold cases, are solved with nuclear DNA, almost all of them. Mitochondrial DNA, a lot more difficult. That's what we're working with right now. So we have to have a one-to-one -one comparison with a suspect that we have in mind to compare the mitochondrial DNA. There's no database that we can run it through. To get someone's DNA, they either have to consent to it or we have to obtain a search warrant for it. Um, so there are people that we have not been able to get DNA from to test. Have any of them matched? I can't get into that right now. But if, if, the, if DNA matches, mitochondrial DNA matches, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are the suspect. About 300 yards from where Amy's body was found, investigators recovered a curtain and a blanket. Those two pieces of evidence have been analyzed over the years as DNA has progressed. We've been able to have them analyzed more than once. Uh, and recently, within the past six to eight months, we were able to determine through lab results that hairs that were found on the curtain and the blanket belonged to Amy. So we were able to say definitively that that blanket and that curtain had to be at least next to her at some point. Our theory is that they were used to wrap her in before she was dumped where she was found. Um, we believe strongly that that blanket and that curtain will be a tie to the person that's responsible for this. The curtain in particular is incredibly unique. It's avocado green, floor length, possibly homemade. The stitching pattern makes it look like it was a bed quilt at one point. If we can find out where that curtain came from or who owned that, we believe strongly that would take us to the person responsible for this. Whether it came out of that person's house, whether it came out of the location where Amy was killed. We know where Amy was abducted, we know where she was found, we don't know what happened in between there. Detectives believe Amy was killed shortly after she was abducted in Bay Village. What's unclear is exactly where the murder took place. 
Amy's body was found about an hour south in Ashland County. The murderer, investigators say, will have ties to both locations. Ashland is not very close to Bay Village, so the area where Amy was found is in the middle of nowhere. Somebody would have had to know that area or would have had to have been in that area before and had a plan to take Amy to that area. It's just too far out in the middle of nowhere, or it was in 1989, 1990. As for any type of vehicle description, Detective Sergeant Ellish says there's this. There was never a vehicle that was seen. We can only say that there were camel colored fibers taken off of Amy's clothing and her body. Um, that when we researched them, they seemed to come back to a mid to late 70s model GM product. But that would encompass multiple different types of vehicles. Investigators have been able to fill in more of the timeline from the day Amy was taken. Haunting details like this. Every day after school, Amy would call her mom. That day was no different. Amy's killer allowed Amy to make that phone call to her mom in his presence. Here's FBI Special Agent Phil Torsney. It appears that she was making that at the time, at a time she didn't believe that anything uh, bad was going to happen. It appears she still felt comfortable with the person she was with. She may have been still on a shopping trip, at least in her mind, she's still on a shopping trip at a local mall or a shopping center and believes she's still um, going to get a gift for her mother and please her mother, which was what all this was about in Amy's mind at that point. Amy's dad, Mark, refers to Phil Torsney as the bloodhound. He's the FBI agent who tracked down infamous mob boss Whitey Bulger. Torsney has been hunting for Amy's killer since the beginning. He rolls up his sleeves as he speaks to me. The person who did this and called Amy, uh, this was, it was a process for him. He set this up. He, he, uh, he thought about it a little bit. A lot of crimes that are committed, they, they happen spur of the moment. A person sees a target of opportunity, whether it's you know, a theft or, or um, any other kind of crime, and, and they take advantage of it. In this case, this person, you know, he was a thinker. He, uh, he was willing to take risks. Before Amy's disappearance, at least two other girls who lived near Bay Village got phone calls at home similar to Amy. Torsney believes it was the same man. Based on the facts that the calls were very similar, there's a, there's a likelihood it was the same person, yes. What is the connection between those three girls? Well, proximity, they all, and, and it wasn't, there were, there were several girls that received similar phone calls. And we've looked at a lot of those phone calls and a lot of uh, people have come forward saying they had received similar phone calls. And really it's proximity, uh, this, this area. We're looking for somebody that received those phone calls in this area. It is very likely that Amy is not this predator's only victim. People have a script sometimes, and they follow a certain script, even, even criminals, when they start off in one direction and they keep on that script, and they, they, it's, it's sometimes successful, sometimes it's not, and they change it a little bit, but when it's successful, they keep exhibiting the same behavior, and we believe there's a good likelihood up to a point the individual who did this to Amy attempted the same kind of phone calls or attempted the same kind of crime, at least contact with a young victim. Before or after? Well, before and after. Amy's killer is still out there. Do I think the person is still alive? Yeah, I think the person's still alive. Three decades later for Amy's dad, the pain of losing his little girl has never gone away. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and you gotta move even if it's minuscule steps you got to keep moving and uh, you got to keep going amy's mother margaret died in 2001. she never got over her daughter's death whoever did this to amy took a lot of other lives either destroyed them or changed their outlook or caused other people to uh, probably die earlier than they should have 
Mark now longs for the day he gets the call that Amy's killer has been found and arrested. It won't bring Amy back, of course, but it will finally mean she can rest in peace and that justice has finally been served. There's a $50,000 reward for information leading to the man who killed Amy Mihaljevic. Call the Bay Village Police or the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. For the dark side of the land, I'm Nicole Versansky. Subscribe now for future episodes and find more Dark Side of the Land and photo galleries related to these cases at cleveland19.com.